Hey there, TBD listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out, whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes. SAP can help. To learn more, head to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. On Sunday night, Boeing had to make a big decision. Plead guilty to conspiring to defraud the federal government, a felony, or risk going to trial against the Justice Department. The company took the plea. They gambled and they said, what's going to be worse for us? That's Oriana Pollock, who covers aviation for Politico. And sure, a felony plea is pretty big, but... They know, I think, that it could also potentially get worse if they went to trial because, again, it would just create a barrage of more bad press and bad headlines. And maybe they just wanted to stave that off a little bit. So a guilty plea kind of nips it in the bud. The conspiracy charge against Boeing stems from two fatal crashes of 737 MAX 8 planes in 2018 and 2019. 346 people were killed. On Sunday, an Ethiopian Airlines flight crashed shortly after takeoff in the capital of Ethiopia. All 157 people aboard were killed. It happened less than six months after an incident on October 29th, when a Lion Air flight crashed shortly after takeoff in the capital of Indonesia. All 189 people aboard that flight were killed. The one thing these two flights have in common is that they were aboard new models of the same airplane, a Boeing 737 MAX 8. After the crashes, Boeing agreed to make major safety changes. But the government says the company didn't do that. Now, Boeing has agreed to pay almost half a billion dollars in fines and work under the eyes of an independent monitor for three years. It's yet another black eye for a company that's had a spectacularly bad year. You can imagine a big metaphorical stamp that just says felon. There are going to be certain federal agencies that do business that, you know, might take a second look and say, well, you guys are kind of climbing out of a hole right now and you need to work through a lot of issues that you've admitted to and that the FAA is now involved in and the NTSB is involved in. And how do you rectify it? Today on the show, Boeing pleads guilty. Is it one step on a long road back to safety and stability? Or more evidence of a need for profound change in how the company operates? I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. At public.com, you can earn 5.1% APY with a high-yield cash account. 5.1%, that's an industry-leading rate. Plus, there are no fees, like zero, so you can maximize your interest. Because what's the point of earning a high yield if you have to spend a bunch of it on fees? At public.com, it's just 5.1% APY, straight up, no strings attached. They don't even have balance requirements, so you can deposit as little or as much as you want and Public provides up to $5 million FDIC insurance. That's 20 times the standard coverage. So to recap, that's 5.1% interest with no fees, 5.1% interest with no minimums or maximums, and 5.1% interest up to $5 million FDIC insurance. Start earning an industry-leading 5.1% APY on your cash, public.com. This is a paid advertisement for public investing. 5.1% APY as of June 17th, 2024, and is subject to change. Full disclosures in the podcast description. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP. 
where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, as our company expands, so do our hiring efforts. How can AI help us attract top talent? Signed, Searching for Higher Power. So, Searching for Higher Power, one of the most daunting undertakings of an HR leader today is building a new team and finding and vetting new talent. This is a very time-consuming process and can take precious organizational resources. As a companion to the HR team, AI technology can be used to create job descriptions, analyze candidate resumes, and filter candidates into various pools based on experience, skills, or any other parameter. You can also use AI to match internal talent with positions available. Parameters for this can be set, rules can be set, that can all be done through the algorithm. There are so many things that we as humans could be not looking at that AI can do in a matter of seconds. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. I want to back up and give listeners some context if they have forgotten the details of these two horrific crashes in 2018 and 2019. Can you walk me through what happened? Sure. So in 2018 and 2019, there were two crashes a few months apart, um, one in Indonesia and one in Ethiopia on foreign carriers, of which two planes just went down and nobody actually knew what was the cause of it. They were brand, they were, you know, relatively brand new planes coming off of the Boeing 737 MAX line. And all of a sudden they just crashed right into the ground. And a lot of folks wanted to look at, is this a pilot error? Was it intentional? Um, but what it what manifested from the investigations there was that they looked into the software system, the software that was designed to prevent a plane from tipping a certain way in the air. This software was known as MCAS, Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System. It was designed to compensate for new, larger engines on the MAX jets, which had a tendency to nose the plane upwards. MCAS was intended to make the MAX fly like an old 737, the kind of planes pilots were used to. This software was supposed to level the plane back out, except un unfortunately, because the software wasn't told to the pilots and they were not briefed on the design process, the planes just started diving down and the pilots couldn't override it because they didn't know how. So it was a blame game for a while, and nobody knew whether or not that's pilot error, and they just didn't know how to work these types of things. But really, they just weren't briefed on how to use it. Several countries immediately grounded MAX jets in response. The United States, home of Boeing, was one of the last countries to do so. There were conversations ongoing with then-CEO Dennis Muhlenberg and then-President Donald Trump on, are these planes safe? And at the time... Dennis Muhlerberg was saying, no, this is our planes are safe. It's it's something else is going on and we'll look into it. But at that point, you know, the public was in fear because another plane had just gone down for a possibly similar reason of why are these planes just nosediving? And then the FAA decided to ground them. They were grounded for 20 months until everyone investigated the root causes and talked about, again, that software that pilots were not briefed on. And ultimately, that's where the charge of defrauding and conspiring to defraud the government came from. How did this become a criminal case? How did it shift from scary crashes to the government says you've done something wrong? Ultimately, it was how Boeing admitted of, through its uh, court process eventually that we've said, yes, that these employees were not only negligent, but they didn't talk to uh, the FAA about this design process. Um, so it was a lie by omission, if you want to look at it that way. And they moved through that process and the government said, OK, well, this is the charge that's mo most likely to fit the bill for, for what we're talking about here when we talk about this agreement. And I think that the government ultimately walked through its decision making process and said, OK, how can you prove X, Y and Z items when you're talking about negligence versus how can you prove X, Y and Z um, items when you're talking about actual premeditated decision-making. Um, and so that's where we ended up with that agreement on conspiring to defraud. 
the DOJ said in 2021, um, two 737 MAX technical pilots basically, what, didn't, didn't provide information to the FAA about the MCAS, and that would have helped other pilots understand why the plane was acting the way it was? Yes. Uh, ultimately, it was um, it was called the FAA uh, Aircraft Evaluation Group. And, you know, and was it really just two employees? Of course, that's what the DOJ ultimately hmm. uh, talked about and, and said that this is what we can say and prove from the court documents that were received. But, you know, you've heard from whistleblowers as well. Uh, over the course of these investigations who've said, we've known about issues from manufacturing to this item to multiple items that have kind of cropped up. And, you know, I think the FAA over the last several months, um, since so many have come forward, have been talking about how do we take this seriously and what do we investigate and what do we look into on what's very serious or what's actually, you know, a little bit outlandish. And I think it's they're just trying to rectify how they look at some of the information that comes forward um, on on what these whistleblowers are saying, what these employees and former employees are saying uh, when it comes to what's been omitted, what could have been told to us ahead of time, what the FAA could have done uh, with helping that certification process. Um, I'm sure you've heard from, you know, lawmakers, especially uh, former lawmakers who oversaw these investigations, who said, you know, we didn't we didn't hear enough from a lot of employees. We didn't hear enough, especially from the FAA. Um, we figured out that the FAA had a ton of folks down the way in Washington state there that should have been on the plant floors when they were certifying these planes and building these planes. And why weren't they there? And that is the criticism that perhaps perhaps it's gone a little too lax between Hmm. how the FAA and how Boeing ultimately, you know, work together to make planes that everybody gets on sometime in their lifetime when they take take a flight. In 2021, Boeing and the government reached a settlement which required the company to pay two and a half billion dollars, some of which went to victims' families and overhaul its safety practices. Then, almost exactly three years later, Alaska Airlines Flight 1282, a Boeing 737 MAX 9, suffered an explosive decompression. A piece of the fuselage, a door plug, blew out of the plane at 16,000 feet. That raised big questions about whether Boeing had truly worked on its safety practices and prompted one government investigation after another. And then ultimately, um, the FBI began interviewing passengers from that flight, Alaska Airlines Flight 1282. And of course, once the FBI gets involved, this is a criminal investigation. So that's when the probe of DOJ's probe got a little bit broader to see, you know, how that factored into the deferred prosecution agreement that they made in 2021. Um, And let's review everything that that Boeing was supposed to do um, over the course of its three-year period, over the course of that three-year probationary period. And ultimately, I think that's what you hear from some of their Boeing's big, biggest critics is that, you know, you had five years to make changes and then Alaska happened, so maybe you didn't. After Alaska 1282, the FAA examined Boeing's MAX production line. The company failed 33 out of 89 audits. The headlines after the FAA did their audit were were not so great either. I mean, um, you saw FAA Administrator Mike Whitaker go to the podium um, and talk about, you know, the things that he didn't like to hear when he toured Boeing's factory floor, which was they didn't talk about safety when before they started their jobs. Um, that audit also made headlines of how they put planes together on the 737 MAX line, which included using hotel key cards to check for how parts fit together and using Dawn dish soap um, for whether or not they're, you know, how they lubricate certain items to help pieces fit together instead of actual, you know, (laughs) tools that you're supposed to be using to make planes. And then after that happened, of course, you heard from more whistleblowers who talked about other planes uh, that have um, been manufactured with subpar workmanship as well. And so it's just been it's just been this cascading multitude of info that we've all seen play out that, again, it's not just the bad headlines from each incident, but it's just it just piles on to 
showing that Boeing should have been doing these things and perhaps they weren't or they just, you know, let certain things slide by. And again, that's just what that's what the government's trying to figure out. When we come back, where do regular flyers fit into this picture? This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great tax rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Whatever you think about the presidential campaign circus, one thing is guaranteed. The U.S. Supreme Court is going to be absolutely central to what happens in the coming election. And they've just released a raft of decisions that reach into just about every aspect of your life, from pollution to air travel, abortion rights, gun violence, and of course, presidential immunity. I'm Dahlia Lithwick, and we just wrapped up our Opinion Palooza series on Amicus, Slate's podcast about the courts and the law, where we break down the weedy details of Supreme Court news to make it accessible to real, smart, non-lawyer people like you. It has been a truly mind-boggling seven weeks of news from the high court, and we want to make sure that you understand it all. All of the episodes in this series are now available, and if you become a Slate Plus subscriber, you'll get access to a whole bunch of bonus episodes, too, like The Court of King Alito, where we examine how this justice's fondness for flag-waving intersects with how he does his day job. Listen to Opinion Palooza on Amicus Now. That's A-M-I-C-U-S, wherever you're listening now. Boeing in this plea deal has agreed to pay roughly half a billion dollar fine and invest almost another half a billion in compliance and and safety programs. But for the families of the crash victims on the Lion Air and Ethiopian flights, that is not enough. How much does it matter how the families react? It's going to go back to the Northern District of Texas, which is where the same judge has been involved in this case before with the 2021 agreement and ultimately where families have petitioned this judge before on what they've wanted to see. If you look through some of how this has played out over the last several years, the judge has seemed to defer to DOJ on these matters um, and how DOJ handles, you know, putting in um for uh, for example there's a third party monitor that's a conditional of having people oversee Boeing's work in addition to the FAA and right now the families feel that they for example need to be involved in that process we should make the decision of who's overseeing Boeing and DOJ in in a filing just this week said you know you can't be hasty with something like that and we have to wait until the judge signs off on a conviction so you know the families are ultimately trying to get one or two steps ahead of what they already believe is going to be an unsatisfactory answer to them because Hmm. they don't feel that justice has been served here. Families are trying to petition the judge to not only not sign this agreement that DOJ and Boeing have, um, you know, corroborated on to plead guilty for Boeing, they want other needs met. And that in- includes, I think the fine that they proposed actually was $24 billion hmm. instead wow. of, yes, it, it's, it was a hefty fine. I mean, that's, that's, that's a fine that, you know, ultimately would put a, I couldn't even say a wrinkle in Boeing's business that would ultimately put some of Boeing uh, and their operations probably out of business. <laughs> that's, that's again, uh, that's a astronomical number. Again, they want to see they want to see Boeing hurt. And, and, you know, it's it's been a long road for them. And, 
you know, they've always said, you know, if only, if only these pilots knew, if only they knew, then this wouldn't have happened. Um, but they didn't know. And that was because of that. It was more than just an error on Boeing's part. It was the fact that people should have been at the forefront of telling the FAA on how these systems work. And I think in many ways that's understandable because aircraft manufacturing is basically still a duopoly. And, you know, Boeing still has major government contracts. Are any of those in jeopardy or do they just continue apace? So it might get a little complicated. Um, It's to the degree of how complicated it might get. Um, Will certain government agencies, and of course, it's mostly the military in this respect, right? Um, You know, you have the Defense Department of and the services that have multiple contracts with Boeing. And, and, you know, over the last several years, Boeing has basically won those contracts because in, in that world, there's also a duopoly of what they make. I mean, the biggest defense contractors there are Boeing and, and Lockheed Martin. So again, we're back to a, a giant duopoly of, of you know, certain um, defense contractors that always tend to win contracts. Um, there are a few others, of course, but, you know, it's it's one of those things where maybe the next time around there's a contract award, perhaps the federal government will say, I don't know. I mean, how has Boeing done with the work that they were owed to us right now? Um, You know, Boeing is not shy about talking about the deficits that it has taken on some of their earnings calls, saying that we're in the hole right now for this program that we have with the Air Force, or we're in the hole for this program that's still months behind with another service. And as we're seeing also, they have a space program that's, that's having some issues, of course. So maybe the federal government going forward says, I don't know, maybe we'll think twice. Um, Maybe we just say, you know what, we're going to go with one of the other contractors this go around. You know, the government is one customer. um, And maybe people who fly think of themselves as a Boeing customer, but really the commercial airlines are the big ones. Have any of those significantly shifted their strategy in the wake of what we've seen over this past year? Yeah, I think you've definitely seen the airlines talk about bringing in Airbus into some of their fleets in the future. Um, United is one of those airlines. Uh, They've, you know, ultimately seen that not just the FAA investigation that kind of crimped all of this together for them, but this has also put a lag time on the certification of other aircraft for them, also in their MAX line, um, the MAX 10 and the MAX 7, which are also delayed in the certification process with the FAA. A lot of the airlines that have spoken up had those orders on contract already. And now with those delays being pushed into 2025 or longer, you know, you've seen airlines say, oh, well, you know, if we don't get new planes, then I can't hire new pilots to fly those planes and I can't train people to fly those planes. And I can't do this, that, or the other thing. There was that meeting um, just a few months ago that the airlines got together and said, we want to hear from Boeing's board. Uh, And they didn't want to hear from CEO uh, David Calhoun. They wanted to have a meeting with Boeing's board and say, hey, what's going on? Because look at these orders that are unfulfilled. Look at how our business now has to take a hit in some of our future operations. And we just don't like it. So when that kind of made headlines uh, that, you know, we demand to speak to somebody, a few days later, we saw CEO David Calhoun say, um, you know, I, I'm going to step down by the end of the year because, you know, ultimately, I maybe have not satisfied our, our you know, number one customer. And that's at, that's the airlines right now. It's not just airlines that are wary of doing business with Boeing. It's their suppliers and manufacturers, too. Part of their businesses have taken a hit because, of, you know, the lag time and all of the things that I just mentioned, the certification, how planes are getting an extra scrutiny from the FAA, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it also applies to other manufacturers who are now wondering, you know, I supply Boeing uh, with how we do business. Spirit Aerosystems, of course, makes the fuselage is one of them. But there's other suppliers, too, who are, you know, sitting here wondering, is the FAA going to turn its eye toward us now because of Boeing's malfeasance and negligence and in, in what it, it did with the door plug incident of the four bolts and who worked on that and go down that rabbit hole. But yeah, so there's concern also, not just from airlines, but people who work for some of those suppliers and say, okay, well, 
we we want to keep in tip top shape, but we don't necessarily want a wandering eye on our business either. So it it was just a can of worms that ended up opening up because of all of this. Where do regular people, the flying public, fit into all of this? Do we or are we just afterthoughts? Well, if anything, um, with the flying public, I mean, you can see that people have taken a lot of action into their own hands in the sense that when they book a flight, uh, now you have the ability to filter out whether you're flying on an Airbus or a Boeing jet Hmm. when you book those flights. So I think the concern is there. But, you know, when something happens with, you know, the, the general flying public where they see all of these headlines on the evening news they're going to be rightfully concerned and they're going to wonder, you know, what does this do for my flight? Do I safely get from point A to point B? Um, how how am I factored in? And again, it's become incumbent on the airlines to say, hey, I'm going to put you on this. I'm going to, this is how your flight works. Now you're seeing airlines talk about uh, upgrading their apps to see like how weather impacts your flight. So people care. People, you know, back in the day would just get on a plane, go go, go from one place to another and say, I'm, I'm, I'm great. Thanks. Thanks for the nice flight. Now people are taking all of these factors into consideration and they're, they're ultimately wondering is all of this going to work out and be okay? But ultimately, you know, flying is still the safest form of transportation. Boeing's just going to have to rectify how how people feel um, by improving its its process. Because at the end of the day, you're talking about hundreds of people getting on planes every single minute, and they just want to feel safe. Oriana Pollock, thank you so much for your reporting and for talking with me. Thanks so much for having me. Oriana Pollock is an aviation reporter for Politico. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell, Patrick Fort, and Shana Roth. Our show is edited by Paige Osborne. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. And TBD is part of the larger What Next family. And if you like what we are doing here, the single best way to support our work is to join Slate Plus. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. All right, we'll be back on Sunday with another episode. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening.